Um, and I was here because, because of the closed captioning. That's what we talked about. They had a little name tag thing, and it had my name, and it said National Captioning Institute, and so on. Although, somehow, we ended up talking mostly about Klingon. <laughs> and a guy came in who was also, a, a, I was a mentor. And a guy who was also a mentor. He came in a little bit late, he apologized for being late, but he said he'd had a crazy day. Turns out that he was the social media guy for Rosetta Stone. And that morning, a thing showed up on the internet, on Facebook and Twitter and all those things. That Rosetta Stone had issued a new language course. And it was Klingon. <laughs> and I saw that, because I saw, I saw it on Facebook. I had friends literally from around the world send me, did you do that? And I hadn't heard anything about it. I said, oh my god, how did they do that? Who did it? Then I realized what day it was. Because the MLC meeting, the expo thing, was on April 1st. <laughs> and I said, oh, you know, what a great job these guys did. And the, the ad was beautiful. And what, the way they talked about it, they really knew what they were doing. Um, but the, the Rosetta Stone media guy, this guy named Aviat, um, he was just had a holy, because he had to deal with emails, this and that, what's Rosetta Stone, how, what's the response going to be? So, so I apologize to him uh, for kind of ruining his day or giving him, giving him a But I thought about this for a while. Like, why did they do that? Whoever did it, Rosetta Stone didn't put this ad out. They did, they did exploit it in a good way, but they didn't put the ad out. But whoever did had some reason to think that this would be a funny joke. They could have picked something else. They could have put out a Rosetta Stone in Pig Latin or something or other. But they didn't. They put it out in Klingon. I think, well, why is that? And I think the reason for that is somehow or other, uh, they, they got the idea that even though it wasn't true, you know, it, it could have been true. There's Klingon speakers out there. The language has been around for 30 or 35 years, depending on what you consider its birthday. Um, and there's people all over the world who speak it with varying degrees of skill, some not so good, some are astounding. Um, they could have picked something else. I mean, they could have picked another made-up language. They could have picked Navi from, from Avatar. They could have picked Rothraki from Game of Thrones. Those are all perfectly good languages that have perfectly good grammars and lots of speakers and so on. But they didn't. They picked, they picked Klingon, probably because it was older, it's been around longer. And probably, really, if we're going to use the, the, what, the, the modern the American Dialect Society's word of the year for 2013, because Star Trek. You know, that's, <laughs> really, that's, that's, that's where they picked it. Anyway, given that the faux Rosetta Stone folks thought that, that they gave Klingon the badge of authenticity, I thought what I would do is talk about what it is that they thought you should all learn, even though, obviously, they didn't have anything other than a box. Um, so I'm going to talk about made-up languages for science fiction. I'm going to restrict it to movies. I mean, I could talk, I'm, leaving, I'm going to leave out novels and things like that, which is, I realize, leaving out the vast majority of what is out there. <laughs> Nevertheless, talk about the movies. Um, and in the movies, you know, typically the stories of ex space exploration, uh, an alien race encounters us, or we encounter them on their turf or on our turf. And we have to have conversations. Right? Otherwise, there's no plot. If, there's, if the two communities can't, can't talk to each other, there's no plot. Unless that's the plot. You know, <laughs> Generally, it's not. So we have to get, on, get, to get on with it somehow. So how do we do this? Well, the language, means of communication of the aliens you know, could be anything. It's science fiction. It could be a, uh, something other than talking. It could, could be a, a visual thing. It could be light waves. It could be body motion. It could be brain. Who knows? It could be anything. However, in the movies, generally speaking, it's talking. And it sounds pretty much like what you hear of a regular human vocal apparatus. That's because the actors tend to be humans with a regular apparatus. <laughs> But they still have to deal with, with this language problem so they can get on with the plot of the movie. They have to, okay, we have to establish some convention for how these people are communicating with each other. So there's a number of techniques that have been developed. One is avoid the problem altogether. Uh, just use English hmm. or the language that the, that the film is in. But for English language films, there's a lot of times you see people from outer space who, not a lot of times, I'd say virtually all the time, people from outer space speak 
perfectly good 20th, 21st century American English. It's astounding. <laughs> Unless they're really mean, in which case they speak British English. <laughs> so that's one way of doing it. Uh, they, can sometimes, they sometimes explain this away in various ways. They talk about a device, Star Trek does this, called the Universal Translator. There's something in the built into the ceiling somewhere that lets everybody understand everybody else. Okay, we've got that problem out of the way. Or you put a fish in your ear, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, or, or just forget it. Just get on with it and talk English and hope that nobody notices. That's one way of dealing with it. Another way is to have the alien speak some kind of funny language, minimally. A word here and there, a very short sentence here and there. When that happens, generally speaking, the, the sounds that the aliens are making phonologically are, so, are syllables or little, little short words that could be whether they are or not, could be in the language that the rest of the movie is in. In other words, if the, the movie is in English, the syllables are, could be perfectly good English syllables. Um, sometimes people get a little bit more elaborate than that. Uh, you can do some research. There was a movie years and years ago called Quest for Fire. There's a bunch of cavemen running around looking for fire. That's what they called the movie that. Um, and, and they went from tribe to tribe to tribe, and each tribe talked a little bit differently. There was no English at all. There was all these strange languages. And the people who made that movie uh, did a lot of research into Indo-European, into Proto-Indo-European. And the languages and languages or dialects in that movie were based on Proto-Indo-European. That's pretty good. Uh, or you might let a computer do it. Star Wars did this. I understand at least for one of their two of their languages is fit an information computer and come up with the lowest common denominator or something or other. Or use a real, but hopefully obscure, language that no one's going to understand, unless you happen to show the movie in that particular country. There's an urban myth, I have no idea if this is true, that in Star Wars uh, Return of the Jedi, there's a scene where um, um, Billy D. Williams is the actor, and his, his name is Lando... Yeah, he has a he has a helper, he's a big muppet, and, and the helper speaks something the subtitles, and the story goes that that's some kind of uh, Niger Congo language from uh, <coughs> Kenya or Tanzania or something, and what he's saying is, a thousand herds of elephants are standing on my feet. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what has been floating around for years. A third technique, which is relatively new in, in the history of the movie, is make up a real language and have people really speak something that makes sense. The first time uh, that that ever happened, uh, taking this approach, was in a, a kids' TV show in the 70s called Land of the Lost, where there's uh, a father and his two kids who somehow end up in some kind of alternate universe, and there's dinosaurs and cave people and things like that. And these cave people are called the Pakuni, and they have their own language. And that language was made up by a linguist at UCLA named Victoria Franken. And her idea, and the idea of the producers, was that over time, by watching this series, you know, every Saturday morning, whatever it was on, by the end of a little while, uh, the audience would be able to understand some sentences and carry on short little conversations in the language, because they would structure it in such a way to repeat the things and illustrate different verb paradigms, or whatever, whatever they were. Anyway, the series didn't last long enough for that to ever happen, but it was, it was a really good idea. As far as I know, no one ever made up a real language for a TV show or a movie after that until 10 years later, and that language was Klingon. So let's go on to Star Trek. In the original TV series, which was you know, in 1966, 1969, around in there, the most frequently heard non-English language, most frequently heard alien language, was Vulcan. Uh, and the writer's approach to making a Vulcan was the gobbledygook approach, just noises <laughs> that make cute little syllables. There's words like anwun, which is some kind of a weapon. Kalifi is a challenge. Uh, and there's only one sentence, as far as I know. One Vulcan sentence in the original series, which is a one-word sentence, but it's a sentence nonetheless, which is kroika, which means stop, cut it out. Okay? Now, all of this is based on the sounds are all perfectly good English sounds. An moon is on, plus swoon without the S. Kali fee sounds like something you'd pay to get your 
dog from the dog pound or something. Croicus, <laughs> uh, like and cry. You can, you, can, you can figure it out. Anyway, that's where all that came from. There's no grammar uh, at all. In Star Trek The Motion Picture, there's more Vulcan spoken uh, towards the beginning of the movie. There's a scene where Spock is being inducted into some kind of a cult <coughs> called Kolinar, also good English syllables. Um, and when they originally filmed that scene, uh, the, there's a, a Vulcan high priestess or something, and she's conducting the ceremony. And she's speaking in English when they originally filmed it. Afterwards, when they're putting the film together, doing the editing and stuff, they said, you know, it doesn't make any sense for her to be speaking English. It's a Vulcan ceremony. They're on the Vulcan planet. Everyone around is a Vulcan. There weren't very around. There's like three characters in the scene. But nevertheless, they were all Vulcans. They should be speaking Vulcan. And that's not the real reason they wanted to change it. The real reason they wanted to change it is because they wanted to change the performance. Okay, they did this in Hollywood all the time. Someone says a line and then they dub it in later with different emphasis or something. But, they, but since they were going to do that anyway, they decided, well, let's change it to Vulcan. So they hired someone, I don't know who, this person was always identified to me as that professor from UCLA, <laughs> who it was, who came in and watched the original scene, and listened to the original English dialogue, and basically made up gobbledygook that matched the lip movements that sounded different. Okay? And then they dubbed it in, like, like dubbing in a foreign film. Uh, so, for example, uh, one of the things that this priestess says is, is the phrase total logic, because it's Vulcan. If you know what the Vulcans are all about, that makes sense. Uh, and that comes out in this uh, Vulcan version as sociologica. Okay? But they change it in the subtitle. Subtitle says pure logic, so you won't notice. Uh, the most common, most well known line in Vulcan, or the thing for a Vulcan to say, is live long and prosper. Right? They had to dub that one in too. And if you go home and look in the mirror and don't make any noise and say, live long and prosper, live long and prosper, tif torez mozma, tif torez This happened, this technique happened again with the next Star Trek movie, they're on a roll, Star Trek II, you know, Rafik Khan came out in, in 82. Uh, there's a scene where Mr. Spock and a female Vulcan, who had never met before, a new character named Savik, or Savik, they still haven't decided after all these years how to say her name. Uh, and they talked to each other, same deal, they were originally talking to each other in English, because that's what the script said to do. Uh, but in editing, they decided, no, nah, they shouldn't talk English, they should talk Vulcan. Once again, the real reason was, as a result of editing, what the lines originally said didn't make sense anymore. The tense was wrong or something, it just didn't work. And the easiest way to fix that is to make up some gobbledygook, match the lips, put in the subtitles saying what you really want it to say. That's much easier and cheaper than shooting the whole scene all over again. In fact, one of the producers of that show thought it must have been really easy to write for Darth Vader. You can make up all of his lines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I did that. That was, that was my entrance uh, in, into Star Trek. Um, the, the rationalization for having them speak Vulcan, because you can't just do it, is this showed some kind of a special connection between Spock and Sabu. They were both Vulcans, okay? No one ever said that in so many words. They all had to point ears, both of them. But no one ever said, oh, he's a Vulcan, she's a Vulcan. You know? There actually was a line in the movie that did say something about uh, their special connection, but they got cut out of the film for other reasons, not for that. So they oh, here's a clever way to introduce this thing of, of a special connection between them and a separation of them from everybody else. They're still, even though they're a part of the whole Federation thing, they're still a <coughs> slightly separate group. They're still, they're still aliens. So what I did was the same thing as that professor from UCLA did. You know, I watched the film, looked at the lips. I had some constraints this time because I had to make it match the language that was in the first movie. And those funny words from the TV shows had to sound like it was all the same language. Um, and it had to be not too hard, because I had to teach the actors to do it kind of quickly. Um, so there was a phrase that uh, Savik says, that the original line was, he's very human, you know, talking about Kirk. He's very human, which is, came, came out to be, ich fange home, do the same <laughs> mirror trick. Uh, 
And they changed the subtitle. The subtitle is, he's so human. Once again, throw you off. Very clever, these colorful guys. Anyway, so I worked, I worked with the actress playing Sadek, who was um, someone who was like, had no job in Hollywood, or this was her first job in Hollywood, or something like that. Her name was Kirstie Alley. <laughs> uh, and a couple of days later, taught these strange lines of gibberish to Leonard Nimoy, you know, Mr. Spock. Then I left, and I'm driving down the freeway in LA, realizing that I just taught Mr. Spock how to speak Vulcan. <laughs> and I thought, that's cool. Um, that's, that's something not all linguists get to say. Um, and that'll be the end of it. You know, that, that, that's some kind of footnote in my history of, of my career. I was wrong. About a year and a half later, I got a call. They're making another movie. It was Star Trek III. They put them in order. Uh, and the enemy is going to be the Klingons. And they checked around. And they, as far as they could tell, no one was in charge of the Klingon language. And since I did Vulcan, so I wanted to do Klingon. And I've, and I've said sometimes in other contexts, every once in a while in life you're presented with a decision that's really easy to make. Okay? And this was one of them. So I said, yes. And here we go with Klingon. Now before I got involved, there was Klingon. There was Klingon language. Um, the, so, so even though the, you know, the, my biography and my Wikipedia page, which I didn't write, which is not entirely correct, but anyway, um, it says I invented Klingon. That's not quite true, because it did predate me. First time there's ever any mention of the language, it was in the original series, there's a, a famous episode called The Trouble with Tribbles, which you might know. Uh, there's a scene in there in a bar where a Klingon guy insults the Enterprise um, by saying that half of the quadrant knows that the Enterprise is built, you know, is designed like a garbage scowl, is what he says. And therefore, and, and that's why, you know, they're all learning to speak Klingonese, he says. So we know there is a Klingonese, but he doesn't speak any of it. So the only kind of Klingon language we hear in the original series is the names of some characters. Um, um, so they have, they have names like, and this will come up again, like Kang and Kor and Krass, they all kind of sound alike. Um, anyway, the Kling, we know Klingons have a language. When they made the first Star Trek movie, which is about 10 years after the original series, the very, very beginning of the movie, the first thing you see is Klingons. Okay. Uh, but the Klingons are a little bit different. Uh, for one, they have a makeup budget all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> And also they have a language. And this time, the one Klingon speaker is the commander of the ship, the captain of the ship. He's barking on commands in some language with subtitles. Okay, so now the lines really mean what he's saying. So he says things like, Juntach, which means evasive, take evasive action. And Bach, fire, fire the torpedo. Those lines, those words uh, were invented by James Doohan, who's the actor who played Scotty for all those years. Uh, his idea was to make something weird and alien-like and not Earth-like, but I don't know whether he had anything in mind besides that. I don't think he had any consistent grammar vocabulary. I don't know whether he knew what the lines were going to mean ahead of time. I'm not sure about all that. Uh, but in any event, that was the start of the Klingon language of, you know, with some kind of consistent vocabulary and grammar and all that stuff. Uh, about five years later, they made yet another movie, you know, Star Trek III. This, this, the search for Spock, and this is the one with the Klingon, the Klingons. The Klingons were going to be the, the villains, and they were going to speak their own language, and I was, and I was hired to do that. Um, I had discussions with the writer and producer of the film named Harv Bennett. Uh, and we decided in order to make this language sound real and behave like a real language, it had to be real. Okay? So what this meant is I had to develop grammar, vocabulary, a, a reasonable phonological system, and all that sort of thing. Now, when I say it was supposed to be real, that's not quite right. Um, well, with real, real is right, complete is, is not right. Because the goal at the time was not to make a full language, whatever that means. Um, but rather to make up enough to cover the lines in the movie that had to be spoken in Klingon. OK? 
Okay? So there had to be enough of a structure around there to make those lines all work, but if something didn't come up in one of the lines in the movie, I didn't make it up. You know, if, if, if no one said anti-matter reactor or something or other, I didn't make up a word for that, and so on. Um, so, uh, but it was my, my introduction, this Klingon stuff, was, it was my introduction to uh, constructed languages, invented languages, you know, people call them conlangs. I didn't know that word then. Um, but suddenly I'm a conlanger. And, Usually, people who, who are into this, into making up languages, have, have different kinds of goals. One goal is to have fun. I mean, a, lot of, a lot of people make up languages because it's fun. It's intellectually stimulating. Uh, sometimes they do it because they think natural languages just aren't good. They're vague and ambiguous and cause all kinds of communication problems. So I'm going to make one up that gets rid of all these kinds of problems. It's going to be perfectly logical and all, everything's going to be categorized perfectly. Uh, according to semantic domains and stuff, and others make a big thesaurus sort of thing in their heads. Sometimes those languages catch on, usually not so much. Um, another reason people do something like this is because they decide that uh, we're going to solve the problem of people, two people getting together who don't have a language in common. If there's a third language that everybody knows, we can all talk to each other. Uh, this will be a, a kind of individual communication, also in some kind of an international setting. There won't, you know, won't be one language that's better than all the others. Everyone speaks the same thing. That was kind of the idea behind Esperanto, which is still spoken a lot. Uh, anyway, Klingon is not that. Uh, Klingon was not made up to be not ambiguous. It was not made up to be easy to learn. It was not made up to establish peace in the world or peace in the galaxy or anything like that. It was made up to hopefully make the movie more fun. That was, that was the original goal. So, I have to make up this language. I had half a dozen lines maybe from the original movie. I had to expand from that. The goal was make up a non-human language. That was, that was the marching orders. All right, make up a non-human language. Well, what's a human language that I could be not that? <laughs> Well, human languages, as you know, are, are patterned to a certain degree. They have certain tendencies in, in the sound systems where, the, where certain sounds go together in the, in the same language and certain ones do not. As a rule, no absolutes. Uh, same thing with grammar. Certain things kind of go together in a language. Certain things kind of you wouldn't expect to find in the same language and so on. So to make a non-human language, I violated those things. Uh, for the sounds, for example, you know, if you're going to have a series of, of dental or alveolar things, you expect them to all be the same, you know, T, D, N, S, all, all apical alveolar, what have you. I can use jargon here, sometimes when I talk about things, <laughs> um, but in Klingon it's kind of a, a, a mix and match between, between alveolar and retroflex. Okay, if there was a whole alveolar series, a whole retroflex series, fine, but it's not, it's like pick one. <laughs> things like that. That, that, that kind of thing shouldn't happen. Uh, I introduced some non-English sounds, so it wouldn't sound like English, bearing in mind that the actors had to learn it, so there's not very many non-English sounds mm. in this thing. Um, what what, what non-English sounds, consonants, there's no non-English vowels in it. Non-English consonants are g, the retroflex thing, ch, 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 and ch are not the same. <laughs> uh, ng, initially, we have it in English, not initially. Now the choices of those particular, uh, the particular sounds are there for various reasons. Uh, ch is there because it was in the motion picture, the first movie, so it's in that, those lines, I have to use it again. Uh, the ch and the ch are there because the script called for a guttural language. It said, so and so says, in his guttural language. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a little bit of a cliche for these bad, evil guys to be speaking in a guttural language, but I'm stuck. I've got the motion picture and I've got the script. But that's it, okay? Other than that, I had kind of free reign, so I made some decisions. For example, I decided Cleon was not going to have a Z sound in it. And the reason for that is Z is kind of stereotypical science fiction, bad guys, alien something or others. Uh, this land of the lost 
that I talked about earlier. There's a creature called the Zarn, <laughs> the planets of the apes. There's Dr. Zayas. Speaking of apes, there's Godzilla. Yes, it's in the middle there. Doctor Who has the Zygons, Hitchhiker's Guide, has, has Zaphid Breedlebox, or whatever his name is. And anyway, there's all these things. And Star Trek is not exempt from this. In Star Trek, we have the Zach Dorns and the Zeldans and the Zelcornians and the Zaytarians and the Zaynars and the character of the Zek and Zolan. It's a whole bunch of Z folks in Star Trek. Klingon, there's no Z. It's been done. So, moving on, I said, okay, another sound that comes up a lot with, with alien bad guys, scary guys, is this is the sound K in science fiction stuff. You have Klaatu, The Day the Earth Stood Still, which is our local DC movie. If you don't know that, go watch it. Uh, Flash Gordon has King Kalen Clytus, Teenage Mutant Turtle, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, has another uh, Kala and a thing named Krang. With more apes, you have King Kong, with a K, Krypton, right, and Kryptonian and all that stuff, all with K. Superman's a nice guy, the other Kryptonians are not, and Kryptonite itself is not good stuff. Freddy Krueger has a K, the uh, Simpsons do it with Kang and Kodos, they're aliens. There's KKK all over the place. Even NPR agrees. Okay, wait, wait, don't tell me. They had to make up, a, in a joke, a, a villain for My Little Pony. Okay. So they made up a villain called Krastos the Glue Maker. <laughs> Star Trek, the same thing. All these K people. There's Kara, Kalar, Klug, and Krobe, and Kryton. There's Khan. Uh, there's the Combs, and the Kelvins, and the Kalandis. And there was a guy named Kodos the Executioner in one of the original series. And he changed his name. Okay? And he changed his name from Kodos the Executioner with a K to Anton Caridian with a K. There's K's everywhere. Okay, for all these bad guys. Then there's Kirk. I'm not sure what to do about Kirk. <laughs> so anyway, I made a decision. There's going to be no K in Klingon. Klingon starts with a K. <laughs> what am I going to do? So I decide I'm going to, I'm going to, stick, to, my, to stick to my rule here. There's no K. That K sound is really a Q, it's farther back. Okay, it's a ka. Uh, the, there's no, the KR sound, there was a villain named Krug, KR sound is really a ka. It's a, it's a uvular African. And the kla sound in Klingon is really a uvular lateral thing, a kla. So it's Klingon, not Klingon. It's just the Federation people are bad phoneticians and they were <laughs> uh, same with the grammar. I had to make up some non-human grammar. So I don't want to go on and on about Klingon grammar here, but just one example mm -hmm. is the basic order of words in a sentence matters in some language. doesn't matter so much in others, but there's still kind of a neutral order of things. If you take sort of the three most common elements, the subject and the verb and the object, there's three of them. Uh, they have to come in some order or other. And if you do the math for three elements, there's six possible permutations of those, subject, object, verb, verb, subject, object, there's six. And if you look around the world, you will find languages, representative languages for all of those six. But some are a whole lot more common than others. So the one that English has, which is subject, then verb, and then object, happens to be a really common kind of neutral word order. The least common have the object coming first. Therefore, in Klingon, the object comes first. Not, so it's backwards from English, you know, it's object, verb, subject. But I didn't choose that because it's backwards from English. I chose it because it's the least common in the earth, on the earth. Therefore, in a weird way, it's the least human. Not to insult the speakers. <laughs> 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 yeah, do that. Um, so anyway, I made up all these lines in Klingon. I, said, I made up all the lines in Klingon where it's said in the script it's spoken in Klingon. I also made up all the lines, I made up Klingon versions of all the lines spoken by Klingons in English. Because sometimes the Klingons, sometimes they spoke English and sometimes they spoke Klingon. So when they spoke English to, to a, a non-Klingon, I assume that that's what it is because only aliens are bilingual. Did you notice that in all the <laughs> um, But when the Klingons spoke together, sometimes they spoke Klingon and sometimes they spoke English according to the script. 
So we decided I should make a Klingon versions of all of those lines, just in case while we were shooting the movie, someone said, hey, wait a minute, you shouldn't be saying that in English, you should say that in Klingon. And I could say, okay, here, say this, as opposed to, oh, let me go back and think about that. Okay. They used zero of those lines. <laughs> but I did make it up, and it helped flesh out the language, so it was a useful thing to do. And they also made up a reason why the Klingons talk sometimes English to each other and sometimes Klingon to each other. They developed this... It's in the introduction to the script, actually, because they wouldn't explain it to everybody. There's a hierarchical system, um, and the higher level Klingons get a better education. Part of the better education is learning a foreign language. <laughs> the lower ones don't get to learn the foreign language. The higher level Klingons use it not only to show their higher level -ness, but also to keep secrets from the lower ones. <laughs> so I had this wonderful, perfect language, right? And I go out to Hollywood to work with the actors, and everyone's very interested in this language. And the way it works when you make a movie, and you've probably, if you've never been on a set, you've probably seen movies about people making movies. Uh, the director yells, action. People do their thing. The director yells, cut. And then what the director does is checks with the camera person and the sound person to make sure it was OK. Hey, did you see everything okay? Did an airplane go by or something? Is it all right? Fine. For this, they would check with the camera person, the sound person, and me. How was the Klingon? Okay. Ah, not so good. Change it. Okay, and we'd do it again. I learned very quickly not to say it was not good. <laughs> very often. Uh, and started taking notes. So, you know, if it sounded like Klingon, even though it wasn't like what I told him to say, says no one had ever heard this language before, you know. If they were supposed to say two, but said toe, all right, that sounds good. Make a note, just toe for how long. <laughs> now, they did take it seriously. The director, the director of Star Trek, it was Leonard Nimoy. Mr. Spock was my boss. I've always wondered if I should put that on a resume. But anyway, <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a scene where the, where the Klingon heavy, Commander Krug is his name, is telling this other guy to, to, to shoot at another ship over there. But don't destroy it, just target the engine. Okay, so the phrase that he's supposed to say in Klingon is engine only, just the engine, which is jota nech, he's supposed to say. So he says, he comes in, he says, I want you to target just the engine, then he says in Klingon, jota nech. Meanwhile, it's cut, cut, cut. You're supposed to be talking Klingon, not French. <laughs> so the point is they did, take it, they did take it seriously. As did the actor, the actor was Christopher Lloyd, who was Back to the Future, that guy. Um, there's one scene where he's supposed to turn. He had two kind of helper guys. One was named Torg and one was named Maltz. I didn't make up the character. <laughs> um, and there's a scene where he's supposed to turn to Torg and he's angry about something. And he says, he says to Torg, say the wrong thing, Torg, and I'll kill you too. He just killed somebody else. Uh, so right before they shot that scene, Christopher Lloyd says to me, Mark, he says, how do you say Torg in Klingon? See, since I didn't make up the names, some of the names they made up didn't really fit into the language, so I made up real Klingon versions of what the names were. So, Maltz is Mach. And Torg, I said, say, Gorg. Gorg. Okay. Spooky dog is probably what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, you know, say the wrong thing, Gorg, you know, and I'll kill you too. And Nimoy is, Nimoy is, cut, cut, cut. He says, why are you calling my Klingon a dork? <laughs> Christopher Lloyd says, Mark told me to. <laughs> Nimoy says, what's the matter with Torg? I said, nothing, Torg is good, do it, you know, do it again. So they did it again, and afterwards Christopher Lloyd comes up and he says, oh, he says, oh I'm so sorry. I got you in trouble with, you know, with the director. I said, no, it's fine, it's fine. He says, but did you notice? He says, I didn't say Torg. I said, Torg. I said it in Klingon. I said, yeah. <laughs> uh, language changes. You, you probably studied about language change somewhere along the line. Well, language changes as a result of movie making as well. You can have a list of causes. Uh, there's a line in the film where, where uh, there's a scene in the film where Krug, the, the, the commander, has three prisoners down on the planet. He's up in his ship. Down on the planet, there's three prisoners and a couple of Klingon guards, and he's talking to Kirk. And he says to Kirk, I'm serious about my threats, and just to prove to you how serious I am, I'm going to kill one of the prisoners. Then he gives the command to, to his guy down there. And what's, what the command means is, kill one of them, I don't care which one. Okay, and the way he said, he gives that command in Klingon. And the way you say that in Klingon, or the way I said to say it in Klingon, is the first line, kill one of them, is, what, you hoch? What? 
means one. The object comes first, remember? Rock <laughs> means one. Yechoch, ye is an imperative, means that the verb is an imperative. Choch means kill. One, kill. Okay? Vait means somebody, anybody. Shashach means I don't care. Anyway. Uh, so we practice the line. We means Christopher Lloyd practice line. Wah, yechoch, vait, jishach. Wah, yechoch, vait, jishach. How serious I am, I'm going to kill one of the prisoners. Then he says, Yechoch, jishach, pep. Nemo yells, cut, that was good. Christopher Lloyd says, I blew it. Nemo says, well, that's right. He says, I said the Klingon wrong. Which he did. He left out the what and he left out the vibe. Nimoy says, this is late Friday afternoon, by the way. Nimoy <laughs> says, Mark, how did the Klingon sound to you? <laughs> it sounded fine. <laughs> now, what I did is made myself a little nonsense. Okay, now, this is going to be in the movie and it's going to say that with the subtitle. Well, this is okay. Up until that moment, ye was a little prefix that meant imperative. Right? So, yechoch means kill. It's still a prefix that means imperative, but only with a singular object. <laughs> right? And so on. So anyway, so we can want to find the grammar. Now we go into post-production. They're editing the film, putting it together. And remember how I said I made up all those Klingon lines for sentences where they talked English and they used none of them? Now they're in post-production. You know, they ought to be saying this line in Klingon, not in English. Can you do that? Can we dub that in? So now I had to make a Klingon lines that match the lip movements, the English lip movements, but fit in with my phonology and grammar somehow. So for example, with this one, this one is easy. There was a word, you see, just says animal. He's a bit angry with something. There's animal, you know, and that's chakibach. Okay. So, but we had to do it with, with, with longer sentences too. Uh, and then they did something even worse. They changed subtitles. So there was a line, uh, it originally meant, well, after this guy, he told him to, to, to target the engine only, then the guy doesn't. That's why he killed him. Um, and explaining why he's killing him, what he says is, I told you just the engine. He says that in Klingon. Kamapu. He says, I told you. Just trust me. Kamapu. Told you. Jotatnech. You learned that already. I told you. Engine only. The subtitle now says, I wanted prisoners. <laughs> oh, <laughs> All right. The object comes first. Kamaput, Jotanev. Kamaput must be the object. That must be prisoners. I wanted prisoners. Kamaput. The put must be a plural suffix. We have, we have another plural suffix, but put can be a plural suffix. Why not? But it has to be distinguished from the other one. So put is a plural suffix for beings that use language, and the other one is for plural <laughs> suffix for beings that don't. As long as I'm making up plural sounds, I'm going to make another one, bru, which means plural for body parts. You know, anyway, so now I've got a bunch of plural suffixes. Uh, Kamat means prisoner. Jota, uh, ech, jota is, I guess, be capture. I wanted prisoner. Okay, John means capture. Ta. Now, jota used to mean engine. But ta is now a, plural, uh, is a suffix that goes on a verb that means to accomplish something, accomplish captioning. Uh, capturing. So, and nech means want. It used to mean only, it still does, but now it also means one. So, so sort of, I wanted to accomplish capturing prisoners. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It also introduced a new, a new uh, uh, linguistic or speech characteristic to Klingon, which I call clipped Klingon. That's kind of leave out little suffix and prefix here and there. It's not ungrammatical. That's the kind of Klingon you speak when you're under duress or in a hurry. <laughs> not a problem. Uh, anyway, so going to Star Trek V. There's more, more Klingon speaking and stuff. There's also Star Trek IV, but there's only whales in it. We don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, doing the, doing the, the language for Star Trek V was a lot harder than it was earlier. And the reason it was harder is because after Star Trek III, I wrote a book. Uh, it's called the Klingon Dictionary, and it's floating around still someplace. Um, and people bought it. So Star Trek V time, I had to pay attention to myself <laughs> and follow my own rules and my own vocabulary. You know, I could make up new stuff if it wasn't mentioned in the book one way or the other. But if it was, I had to do that. And that was much, much harder <laughs> than, than making it. I did some things I should have done. <laughs> anyway, so we moved to Star Trek V. Nemo, or, or there, Shatner was the director on Star Trek V, so Kirk Anspach is 
Shatner's reaction after every Klingon scene was something like, that was great, I guess. I don't know what you did. <laughs> um, then in Star Trek VI, we had to get another new feature to, to, to Klingon, which is Shakespeare. In that movie, the, 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 main, the main head is a guy named Chang, who's played by Christopher Plummer, um, mm -hmm. he's spouting Shakespeare lines all the time. And in the script originally, a lot of them were supposed to be said in Klingon. Uh, so I translated them into Klingon. They ended up using none of those. He said them, he said them in English, which is just as well, because I really didn't know what a Klingon petard was. You know? <laughs> um, anyway, there was one line that did end up in Klingon in the movie that was not originally in the script, or at least it was not originally in the script in, in Klingon. I arrived at the set one day, and the director, uh, this guy named Nick Meyer, says to me, I need one more line. I said, okay, what's that? He says, to be or not to be. I said, okay. And I thought, oh no. Because <laughs> one of the other grammatical features I made up for Klingon is there's no verb to be. That <laughs> or and not, that's okay. So I said, I said, I said what, if, what if it means to live or not to live? That's good. He says, go tell Chris. Now, Chris is Christopher Plummer, Shakespearean actor, big deal guy. So I go over to him. I wasn't sure actually how long if he was enjoying speaking Klingon or not until he, until he started calling me Mark all the time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he says, okay, how do you say to be or not to be? Well, the word for, there's a number of ways I could have done it, uh, but I kind of did it a down and dirty way, which is, which is live or not live. And the word for live, it's in the dictionary, I'm stuck with it, is yin. Or is pach, and bet is a, is a suffix that's a negation. So yin pach, in bet, live or live not. So I tell him that, he goes, yin? I said, yeah, he says, that's, that's too weak. Make up something else. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought a bit, and I said, what, what do we say? Tach, 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 bet? He goes, tach, yeah, let, let's keep tach, that's good. <laughs> Up until that moment, tach was a suffix. It was a continuative <laughs> suffix that meant to keep on doing whatever the verb was. Eat plus tach means keep on eating, continue eating. I kind of promoted it to be a verb in its own right, so it means to go on, to continue, to endure. So tach, pach, tach, ba, is to go on or not to go on, to continue or not to continue. Now, this book, and then in the meantime, there's more stuff to be done. There's next generation, all this stuff. So, okay, anyway, all this stuff kept going. The book, uh, when I wrote it, the, the Klingon edition, obviously I wrote it hoping people would buy it, and, and they did. But they also read it. <laughs> and studied it intently, <laughs> and a whole phenomenon happened of a Klingon speaking community, which I had honestly and truly not, not anticipated. Uh, the people in this community, I think, uh, managed to find each other through the internet. I think if the internet hadn't come along, none of this would have happened, uh, because they wouldn't have known that. They, they think, I'm the only one, who cares? <laughs> um, some of them got very organized, they organized a, a, an organization, organized an organization uh, called the Klingon Language Institute. They published uh, a journal, a quarterly journal, called Hokhed, which is a word for linguistics and language science. Uh, it's in the Library of Congress, catalog of the Library of Congress. You can get it. Um, they hold an annual meeting called the Kep'ah, means meeting. Ah means big, augmentative, so big meeting, that's a convention. <laughs> and in between this annual, in between times, in the interim, they hold littler meetings called Kepkholm, little meeting. Uh, they just held a Kepkholm in Germany last week, and they get more people coming to the Kepkholm than they do coming to the Kep. Ah, this one in Germany had like 50 people, which given the topic is rather amazing. Um, they do a lot of translation work, they translate songs, they write original songs, among the translated songs, and you can find all this stuff on YouTube and, and, and Google and stuff. Um, they you know, translate perfectly the kind of song you'd expect, expect them to translate into Klingon, like the theme song to Sesame Street, you know, <laughs> uh, things like that. Um, but there's Klingon rap, someone did a, a Klingon version of an Eminem song called Without Me. Uh, the Klingon version means there are no old warriors. <laughs> um, there's a Klingon version of Gangnam Style. Uh, uh, 
uh, there's a new album that just came out. The name of the album is Warrior Woman. There's six songs there in Klingon. One of them, one of them is, is Kiss Me. Do you know that song? Uh, um, but in Klingon it's choke, which means bite me. But, <laughs> <laughs> and remember I was telling you about, about to be or not to be. I, when I made up that line, I had no idea how it was going to fit into the movie. But it turns out there's a scene in the movie where the, where the Klingons and the Federation are getting together for a big banquet. They're going to have peace. It doesn't work out. And the leader of the Klingon Empire, his title is Chancellor, proposes a toast. And he says, I'd like to propose a toast to the undiscovered country, he says. And everyone sits there with this blank look on their face like, huh? What are you talking about? Except for Mr. Spock, because he knows everything. And he says, you know, Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1. Which is true, it's part of the to be or not to be speech. Okay, if you could say to be or not to be, blah, 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 eventually they said the phrase, the undiscovered country. The Chancellor of the Klingon Empire then says, you have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. <laughs> At which point Christopher Plummer says, ha, ha, ha. Well, if Shakespeare plays were originally written in Klingon, the Klingon Language Institute folks figured that they owed it to the world, or to the galaxy, <laughs> to not translate, but to restore all the works of Shakespeare <laughs> back to the original Klingon. So they started with Hamlet, because that was the one mentioned in the movie. They've also done Much Ado About Nothing, which is an odd choice, but why not? They've got <laughs> some signs. They applied for a grant from the Folger Shakespeare Library to research uh, to translate, to, to restore you know, the Tempest. They didn't get it, but they were asked to apply again. Uh, now, I have at home, I have a copy of the, of the Klingon Hamlet. Okay, and it's any, like any bilingual thing, it's, it's like that. And one page is English, and one page is Klingon. Okay. But I also have one of the Klingon Hamlet with one page in Klingon and the other page in Czech. There's no English in it anywhere. And if that doesn't prove that Shakespeare was not originally written in Klingon, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> But wait, there's more. Uh, if you go on Google, you can do Google all in Klingon. You can do Facebook all in Klingon if you're very clever and can find out how to do it. If you're a Microsoft fan, if you go to Bing Translator, you can get translations, automatic translations in Klingon. Don't! <laughs> it's a beta, 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 and, and it has some, some issues, but it's nice that it's there. There's a bunch of Klingon apps you can get for your, for your cell phone and stuff like that. Uh, a couple of them are good. The ones based on the dictionary are good, although they're limited because there's a lot of stuff that came out since the dictionary. There's a terrific one called Bokwit, which means analyst or analyzer. Uh, unfortunately, it's for Android only, but it's, it's really, really good. Some of the others are terrible. Uh, Klingon's been used on TV, like in the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Sheldon talks Klingon a lot. <laughs> Uh, now, all that stuff kind of makes sense because that's all kind of geeky stuff. You kind of think that would happen, but there's more. You can buy Monopoly in Klingon. If you find yourself in Australia, there's a cave there, a set of caves called the Janolan Caves. Uh, and you can get one of those, it's like a stick, you know, and you've got the self-guided tour, and you can pick the language that you tour around in. One of them is Klingon. Deutsche Welle, which is a big deal German news agency, you know, on radio and TV. Uh, they have a website, news, news website, it had its 10th anniversary a little while ago. Websites in a number of different languages. They added another one. You know, guess which one? Uh, Klingon is on, the, is on the legitimate stage. There's the opera called Who, uh, which means universe, that premiered in The Hague. It was put together by a bunch of Dutch people. Premiered in The Hague in, in, in 2010. It's 100% in Klingon. Uh, not even super titles, you know, you don't have to know what, what you're doing here. Singing and Kling, singing opera and Klingon is a trip. The <laughs> vowels get kind of messed up. But anyway, uh, there's also uh, an annual performance. It started in Minneapolis in, I don't know, 2007 or something like that. Now it's been in Chicago for the last five years or so. Every year around this time, a Klingon Christmas carol. <laughs> Actually, there's going to be a performance of that here in D.C. Uh, in December. One, one night only. Uh, and it's affected people's real lives as well. Not just, not just this, you know, made-up stuff. Uh, in Oregon, you know, it's 
now it's about I don't know, 10 to 12 years ago. The mental health department was compiling a list of languages they might need to find an interpreter for, just in case somebody showed up <laughs> who spoke, you know, Spanish or Thai or Vietnamese or what have you. And it cling onto the list. The citizenry of that county was very upset, thought this was a big waste of money, even though, of course, it wouldn't have cost anybody anything unless someone did, in fact, show up speaking nothing about Klingon. And if they did, then it would have been a good expenditure of money. Anyway, the thing, I, got, I was interviewed on a radio show about that, the day that the, they pulled Klingon off the list. So it's, it's not there anymore. And there was, it was a telephone call-in show. And this woman called in, and she said she was really happy that they pulled Klingon off the list. And the radio commentator said, why? She said, well, my son has always wanted to study Klingon. And I was trying to discourage him from doing that, saying that was a waste of time. It was a useless language. What are you going to do with that? I, was, I wanted him to study something useful, she said, like Latin. <laughs> <laughs> she said, but if, if, then, if Klingon had stayed on the list, then it would have proved me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, about a year later, there was an episode of ER, that, that show about a hospital, where there's a story about a patient in a psych ward who speaks nothing but Klingon. <laughs> Fortunately, the doctor also spoke Klingon. <laughs> um, anyway, I want to leave some time uh, for questions. What, what, you know, what's happened with this Klingon thing is, as I say, you know, mainly because of the internet, I think, is the language has spread, it's around people, People know it. There's a whole, whole community of speakers uh, who, who carry on and actually really have a good time. If you go to one of these Klingon meetings, what you hear mostly is laughing, not <laughs> <laughs> uh, So these people you know, can enter into the community when they want to. They're not in it all the time. Um, and they can do it. And if you want to enter into it, you should. And I think the best way to do it is to call up Rosetta Stone and see what <laughs> <laughs>